our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord today on this Easter Sunday morning. Although it's raining on the outside, it's good to be in God's house on the inside where we can worship the Lord and enjoy the blessings of God. I would most certainly appreciate every one of you being present with us today. It's always good to meet in the house of the Lord and worship God on the Lord's day. And to you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour we're coming up we can be a real inspiration to many, many listeners, especially shut-in people in the radio listen audience. And if you know of a shut-in or have a friend that you can call them and tell them to tune in and get this good hour, we'd appreciate it very much. You'd be doing them a favor and doing us a favor as well. And so we appreciate you tuning in and getting the broadcast by medium of radio. If you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for the reading of God's Word. If you have the Schofield Reference Bible, you may turn to page 1225. Page 1225 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I want to bring a message today on this line of thought. Why the devil hates a sermon delivered on the resurrection. Now today we are thinking about the resurrection of our dear Lord. We appreciate the fact that he came out of the grave. And there's much involved in the matter of the resurrection. Now the doctrine of the resurrection is the most hated doctrine by Satan and the enemies of Christ and any doctrine that you can mention today it was hated back in the days of the apostles and we'll tell you why it was so hated and why it's so hated today. In our recent trip to the Holy Land just a few weeks ago we were riding from Jerusalem down to the Alabi Bridge to cross over into Jordan and our guide who was a Muslim and he wanted to inform us about the belief of, of the Islamic religion. He wanted to tell us what they believe. That is the Muslims that follow Muhammad. And he told us what they believed and what they did not believe about Jesus. He said they did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He said they did not believe that Jesus was actually crucified. That they crucified someone else in his place and did not crucify him. And he said they, they did believe in the virgin birth. But they did not believe in Jesus rising again from the dead. And his coming back again in great power and glory. He said they did not believe that. He said they believed that Muhammad was the latest prophet. He said they believed that uh, Jesus was a good man and a prophet, but not the Son of God and not very God. They believe that Muhammad was the latest prophet, and their religion is a dead religion. Now, if you've ever been to the Middle East and heard the, the prayer call of the Muslims, uh, Terry is very wearied and has a negative tone to it, and it's a dead, dead religion. And this man, by the name of Assad, who was a Muslim, that has worked with Christian people for a number of years as their guide, it puzzled me why he could not see the difference in the lively attitude and the spiritual joy that he could see in Christian people compared with the dead, cold, formal religion of the Muslims. But the reason he could not see the difference is he was raised as a Muslim and he's in spiritual blindness and darkness and he could not, could not see the difference in how that Christianity was a live religion while the Muslim religion was a dead religion. Now Christianity is the only real live religion in the world today. Christianity, I'm talking about true Christianity, I'm not talking about the so-called Christians are fighting over in Lebanon. They know no more about God than the Muslims know. They just go by the name Christian, but they are not real, true, Bible-believing, born-again Christians. I'm talking about saved people. And the saved people today that are real, genuine Christians, the only one in the world 
that have a live religion and serve a live Savior and a live God. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. Confucius is dead. And Jesus Christ is alive. That makes a difference. And therefore, we have the only real, true, live religion in the world today. And if you would compare the joy, the enthusiasm, the teaching of the Word of God, and our hope for the future, compare Christianity with all the other religions in the world, you can see the difference. There is as much difference as day and night or as being alive and dead. Now you must keep that in mind. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, wherein you are stead, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, lest you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that is, according to the Old Testament Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, that is, of course, the Old Testament Scriptures. That he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. After that, he was seen of James and of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore would it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of, among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then, you, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Now that's as far as I'm reading, but sometime today, I wish you would read the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It has to do with the resurrection through the entire chapter of the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the human body. Now there was a preacher one time, bless his heart, he was striking the point, but he was trying to comfort her dear lady because her husband had passed away. His body was lying there in the coffin as she was sitting down on the front pew doing the funeral service. And he wanted to illustrate a point. He said to her, he said, lady, I let me illustrate the resurrection. He said, now, this body lying here in the coffin is the hull, said the nut, he's done gone. Well, now that might be a kind of a crude way to illustrate the resurrection, but it illustrates a point. When people die, only the body is left, just the hull, as it were. The real soul, the real individual, goes on to be with God. Now, the average preacher today very seldom preach on the resurrection except on Easter. It should not be that way. We should ring the chains on the resurrection quite often and talk about it more often and preach about it more often. It was the main theme of the message of the apostles in their day. Now, if Jesus Christ did not come out of the grave, we'd have a dead God. But he did come out of the grave, therefore we have a live God. I was in that tomb over there about three weeks ago. He's not there. He came out. Jesus came out of that grave. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, he said, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus said that in the book of Revelation. He said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And he says, I'm alive forevermore. So it gives us a live God. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. As we suffer in this life, as we move toward death, Jesus has been right along there, and he knows what we're suffering and what we'll be facing, and he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. There was a little girl one time that found a beautiful bird's nest, had some beautiful eggs in it, and every day she would go and look at those beautiful speckled eggs in that nest. 
One day she went out there, there was only hulls of the eggs there, just the shells, and they were empty. She ran back and told her mother, said, Mama, that bird's nest is a mess, nothing but just shells, it's ruined. Those eggs are ruined. Mother said, Honey, they are not ruined. Said, Those little birds have come out of those shells, and now they're very much alive, flying about among the trees. And so when we die, the bodies only remain behind. We're yonder with God in a soulless body in the paradise of God after we leave the body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We are not ruined. The body is not ruined. We are not The soul is yonder with God. The body waits for the resurrection. Number two, it gives us hope in death. Now, you people sitting here and you people out in the radio listening audience, you have some precious loved ones that's gone on to be with God that's now in heaven. Now, if you didn't have hope of seeing them again and hope of living again, life would be miserable. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. See, the Spirit of God raised up Jesus from the dead after three days and nights. And Paul said the same Holy Spirit that brought the body of Jesus Christ out of the grave is going to bring you a body out in the resurrection. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14, he said, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That will happen at the resurrection. Whenever that takes place, it may take place today. Who knows? That was an unbelieving husband and a believing mother that lost a little six-year-old daughter. They went to view her body for the last time, and that dad stood there. He was an unbeliever. He got ready to walk away. He said, farewell, farewell, my daughter, farewell. And he turned and walked away. Mother, before she turned away, she said, honey, for six years you have been a blessing to us. You have cheered us up. You have been a real thrill and joy in our home. But said, now you're gone to be with the Lord. And said, honey, one of these days, mama will see you again. Now I'm looking forward to that day. Now that's a difference in a believer and an unbeliever. The dad was an unbeliever, he had no hope. The mother was a believer, she knew she'd see that child again. When King David lost his baby, King David said, I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. Now you can't bring your loved ones back, they're in a better world than you are. You'd do them an injustice if you could, but you can go to them. Number three, it is a part of God's plan of salvation. The doctrine of the resurrection, the fact of the resurrection, is involved in God's great plan of salvation. You cannot be saved without believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No man can deny this resurrection and go to heaven. Watch these scriptures. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is impossible for any man to be saved, for any man to go to heaven that doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17, the Bible says, if Christ be not risen, then your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. If Christ Jesus did not come out of that grave, then you're yet in your sins and you're putting forth a foolish effort to be here this morning if Jesus Christ did not come out of that grave. But he came out, hallelujah, and I'm glad that he did. Amen. Number four, we're noticing now why Satan hates the doctrine of the resurrection and the real fact of it. The fourth reason is, it shows by the extreme that Satan went to discredit the fact of the resurrection. Now when Jesus Christ came out of that grave, 
The devil knew he had to try to do something to deny the fact that Jesus Christ came out of the grave. He knew that and the devil got real busy. He said, I must disprove or try to disprove, I'll tone down, eliminate the fact that he came out of the grave. I got to do something. Now, what did the devil do when Jesus came out of that grave to try to discredit the resurrection? The Bible tells you in Matthew chapter 28, verses 12 through 14, exactly what Satan did. Now, let me read. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this sin is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. Now the devil said, I must try to discredit the resurrection. They had soldiers stationed around that grave. And so they knew that. The elders, the religious leaders knew that. They knew those soldiers were there. And as soon as they discovered that Jesus had come out of that grave, they gathered those soldiers together and they said, we've got to do something. I want you soldiers to, to tell the people that you went to sleep. And while you were asleep on the job, his disciples came and stole his body away. And you don't know what they did with it. And if the governor doesn't like it, we'll come to your rescue and secure you from the hand of the governor. And they told that around among the Jews that the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus out of his grave. And today until this very hour, you can ask an Orthodox Jew, what happened to the body of Jesus Christ when they crucified him and put him in the grave? He'll say the disciples came and stole it. That's exactly what he'll tell you. And unto this very hour, the Jews have a steel over their eyes and do not believe that Jesus came out of that grave. They believe the lie of Satan. And that lie has been told among the Jewish people almost 2,000 years. And they believe that today. They believe that lie, the lie of the devil. So he did everything he could by lying. And the devil is lying, the father of lies, to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we move to thought number five. And that is the first persecution came over the resurrection of Christ. Now when Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven and the church was organized on the day of Pentecost and God began to move among the people through the preaching of the word of God, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first wave of persecution that came to the church and to God's people came because of the preaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was their main theme, their main doctrine. They went everywhere telling the people that that Jesus that lived on the earth approximately 33 and a half years and they crucified him and they buried him and after three days and nights he came out of the tomb. They went everywhere telling the people that that Savior came out. Jesus came out of that grave in his glorified body and appeared unto me and he's alive and very much alive at the right hand of God. And when they preached that, the devil's crowd didn't like it. They did everything they could to stop the mouths of the apostles, to stop the mouths of the disciples, and to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4 and the first three verses, the Bible said, As they spake unto the people and the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead and laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day for it's now evening time. They said these preachers are going everywhere preaching that that man Jesus came out of that grave alive. Go put him in jail. And they persecuted them. They locked them up in the jail, in the cell, in the prison because they preached on the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he came 
out of the grave which he did. And the first great wave of persecution came because of the doctrine of the preaching on the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. So it stirred the devil up. It stirred his people up, Satan's people. And Satan doesn't love the resurrection anymore today than he loved it then. And that's why he keeps preachers from preaching on the resurrection, except on Easter. And then they put on a big play, a big program, and play up Easter, and they act very religious. And then on Monday after Easter, go back living like the devil and living like the world. People, they play up Easter, put on all kind of programs and have to carry crosses on their shoulders around and robes and so forth and trying to demonstrate, illustrate the resurrection. And then after Easter's over, they forget all about it, go back living like the devil, cussing, drinking, lying, cheating, stealing, and so whatnot until next Easter. Then they get all wrapped up in the Easter robes and they try to demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ which is abomination in sight of God. Wicked sinners, unsaved people have no business trying to demonstrate or illustrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a shame and a mockery. Only the people of God, the saved people, have any right to celebrate and rejoice over the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you better believe that. Now this caused Paul some of his first trouble that came along. Paul was a mighty preacher, believed strong in the resurrection. In Acts chapter 23 and verse 6, But when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees, the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now Paul was there being tormented and persecuted by the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels. And uh, uh, the Sadducees did not. And when Paul said, I am a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that pitted the Sadducees and the Pharisees against each other and allowed Paul to escape. When Paul preached on the resurrection, the devil really became angry and got stirred up over it. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 21, it says, Except it be for this one voice, that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Paul was brought before the judge. And he said, Sir, the only reason I'm brought before you today is because I preached on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's true. When Paul started preaching on the resurrection, Brother, he stirred up the devil. Satan didn't like it. Because to preach the resurrection from the dead is to preach the deity of the Son of God. In fact, he was very God himself. Then we come to thought number six, and that is it proves the deity of Christ. In John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building. Will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body, when therefore he was risen from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. Now what did Jesus say? He said, Destroy this temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. They thought he was talking about the temple that Herod built. Oh, they said all of these years. Uh, Forty and six years it took to build this temple. And they went about talking about Jesus, said he's going to destroy that temple. He wasn't talking about Herod's temple. He was talking about his own body. He said to destroy this temple, you crucify me, and in three days I'll raise my body back up again. And that's exactly what he did. After three days and three nights, he was raised again from the dead. I firmly, can believe, I firmly believe that Jesus was crucified at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening. He lay in the grave Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. He lay in the grave Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. At 6 o'clock on Saturday evening at the end of the Sabbath, Jesus came out of that grave, having been there 
three days and three nights. Now the Bible says as Jonah was in the bed of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of God be in the heart of the earth. You cannot crucify Jesus on Friday, bring him out of the grave Sunday morning and have him in the grave three days and three nights. Where are you going to get your three nights? Where would you get your three days? You can't do it. You may say, preacher, why do people talk about Good Friday and Jesus being crucified on Friday? That's the rags of Rome, beloved. That's not based on the word of God. You may say, doesn't the Bible say the next day was the Sabbath? Yes. But there were three Sabbaths in succession at that time. Thursday was annual Sabbath. Friday was an annual, annual Sabbath. And Saturday was a weekly Sabbath. Three Sabbaths came that year in succession beginning on Thursday. And Luke said that day was a high day. Signified it was more than Saturday, a weekly Sabbath. So Jesus crucified on Wednesday afternoon, buried at 6 o'clock Wednesday, came out at 6 o'clock on Saturday. He was in the grave three days and three nights, and then just before day the next morning, when they came to the grave, they found he had already come out. He came out at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening at the end of the Sabbath, beginning of the first day. The days begin at 6 in the evening in those days. You must keep that in mind. Then finally, number 7, Blessed is he that hath part in the first resurrection, saith the Bible. God promises a special blessing to you that have a part in the first resurrection. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such a second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. How and when will you have part in the first resurrection? Who will have a part in the first resurrection? When Jesus comes at the rapture, what we call the rapture, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, tells you that he's going to resurrect all the saints of God that died in Christ from the beginning of the church age until the rapture. That's going to happen when Jesus comes. He may come at any time. He's going to bring them out of the grave, every one of them. The Holy Ghost that lived in them is watching over that holy dust. He knows where it is, and he'll bring it out. Amen. And then he's going to translate and transmigrate every true born-again believer that's alive on the earth when he comes. That's called the rapture of the church. And God says, blessed are those that have a part in the first resurrection. And you will have a part in that first resurrection. You'll be preaching kings unto God and you'll reign with him on the earth during the thousand years, the great millennium, beginning at the close of the tribulation period. Now you must keep that in mind. What's the scripture? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy steam? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is law. But thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. At the rapture of the church, those that come out of the grave will say, O grave, where is thy victory? Those that are translated and transmigrated will cry out, O death, where is thy sting? They will not have to cross through the valley of the shadow of death. I've used this illustration many times, but it's so fitting, I want to use it in closing. There was a man one time driving down a rough, crooked road. He was going to visit a man that lived somewhere in that area in a beautiful white mansion. And he lost his way. And he stopped beside the highway and he said to a little boy, he said, son, could you tell me where Mr. So-and-so lives? I'm trying to find his home. He said, yes, sir, I can tell you. He said, you continue on down this road, it's very crooked and rough and rugged, narrow in many places. And said then, when you travel down this road for a while, you'll come to a cemetery. And said, the road goes through the middle of that cemetery. And said, when you pass through the cemetery, you see a beautiful home there, a mansion. That's where he lives. And that's the way it is with God's people. We are now traveling down this rough, rugged, crooked road, very dusty and rough. We have many trials and testings and temptations down the road. 
One of these days, if Jesus tears his coming, we're going through that cemetery. Yeah. Your body will be carried to the mortuary. And from the mortuary, it will be taken to the cemetery to wait unto the resurrection. But beyond that grave, there's a beautiful mansion yeah. on the other side. And when you get through the graveyard, that'll be your home forever in a great mansion on the other side. Amen. Thank God we have loved ones we can see again. I have a precious mother over there. I have a dad over there. Many times my mother's walked down here shouting the victory from one side of this church to the other. I can see her now as she waves her hand and skips across the floor here under the power of the Holy Spirit. Many times she has said, Son, I can't get out and carry the gospel, but you can. Son, go carry that gospel. I'll be praying for you. Don't worry, for me. She, don't worry about me, she would say. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Over there, my mother's waiting. My dad is waiting. Oh, how I'd like to see him. And I will someday. I will someday. You have a loved one, a mother, a dad, or a child, a, close, a husband, or wife, that's over there waiting. They've been through the cemetery now, and they're waiting. You're still traveling down this road, but one of these days, you get to see them again if you're a child of God. If you die in the faith, if you know the Lord. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. Thank you, dear God, for the resurrection of our Savior. Lord, there may be somebody here in this building that's not saved, never been born again, lost without God on the road to hell. Father, I pray that you'll speak to that heart. Help them to know they'll never go to heaven unless they get saved. Hell will be their destination if they die without God. Father, use the message today and speak to every heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me very closely. Debbie's going to play for us in a moment. And as she plays, listen to me. If you're in this building and you're unsaved, you have never been born again, never been washed in the precious blood of Christ by faith, you're a lost sinner. If you die like that, you're just as certain to burn in hell forever as you listen to the sound of my voice. If you'll come down here, we'll help you to Jesus so you can go to heaven when you die. If you're backslidden and you want to get back into fellowship with God, you can. Come down here, we'll help you. If you're in this auditorium and you want to join this church in the way we receive members, you may come. If for any other reason God is speaking to your heart, you may come. If God is speaking, obey the Lord while she plays and while we wait, would you come? I'm not asking you to come down here and give a speech. I'm asking you to come, get right with God, back to God and join the church. about it while we wait. It's point of the man wants to die and after that the judgment. Are you sure you've obeyed God? Are you sure you shouldn't have come down here and let us help you? Are you sure about that? God called me to preach. I preached the message God told me to preach today. It's up to you now to respond to it. Why we wait? Just a moment be going.